Welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart, a pelvic health and musculoskeletal physio. Together we interview leading authorities, we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects of women's health. Please remember that the materials and the content on this podcast are intended as general information only and are for entertainment purposes. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage or do your own thing and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Lowe, and joining me is Marika Hart. It's been two years since we last did a a podcast, episode 54, and you know what? Lots of things have been going on. What's been going on with you, Marika? I cannot believe it's been two years. It's, um, I feels like we were kind of in the depths of covid when we were last doing this podcast, um, we kind of went a bit crazy for a year and smashed out a lot of podcasts. And then, I don't know, life took a hold. Um, I got very, very busy finishing off my master's, which I am done. Hallelujah. So um, graduated end of last year and raising two teenagers and just generally being stupidly busy. And um, yeah, just needed to have that time, I think, just to kind of recuperate and get things done how about you yeah yeah oh before we get on to me uh how did you finish in your masters <laughs> are you throwing me on the spot here Anthony? <laughs> i did yeah. well yes you did I, well yes it, it wasn't just well was it yeah i did very well <laughs> okay <laughs> You can ask Marika privately, but she kind of uh, killed it. Uh, <laughs> she did very, very well. Yes, I did very well in my master's. It was great. Um, it was a it was a long journey, I think. Um, so I studied the Master's of Continence and Pelvic Health Physio at Curtin, which is in Western Australia. Um, I started it probably, I think it took me about four and a half years in the end, um, with a year off um in the middle of COVID it was just all the clinics were shut down because the hospitals weren't really taking many people and I didn't really want to do it on telehealth so I did take a year off in the middle um I absolutely loved it I'm I'm so glad that I I did it I I think from where I started to where I am at now is hard to even compare um but as always you know like a, a, a postgraduate um course is is one part of your your your, your journey um so, but I'm I'm extremely grateful that I did it. Not just for the learning and and I for me, I I can do a lot of courses, but I just forget stuff really easily. And I think having that accountability, doing exams, doing like the case studies and things, so actually getting that clinical reasoning process, um, you know, drilled a lot is I found really helpful. Doing clinics, um, but also the people that I met along the way, like our good friend Edwina, um, who's one of my besties. <laughs> um, who's who, you know and and Jen Vardy and like just other people who I met through the masters who who will be lifelong friends and we're all still continuing to learn and share our experiences and help each other out and I've you know grown a lot from it but it's been yeah it was it was great yeah it's such a good thing to do and um you know it's um there's always that question about short courses or doing a masters and there's advantages for both. And ultimately, it's time, right? Like, when we, you know, when we did masterclass, it was hours every week, because for three months, because it takes time to think about things and discuss things and change things. And um, whether it's a master's or a short course or a series, like time, time under load (laughs) makes a difference. So, um, that sounds like a great experience and um, yes, well done to your achievements out there. Thank you. Marika is very <laughs> modest, but uh, think about like some of the highest stuff. honours that you can have and that's what Marika got. Um, so well done. Um, yeah, look, since uh, July, since July 2021, let's see, mm-hmm. I was working 
2021, July 2021, uh, Sydney was in lockdown and uh, we didn't really come out of it until October of 2021. And um, yeah, then back to back to the work and back to clinics. And I did some online courses of the TFA. And in That's 2022, the female athlete, oh, the female athlete level the one, the female athlete, level <laughs> one. And um, yeah, and then I did diastasis done differently and bulletproof your body. So where we met Marika was actually on a bulletproof your body um oh, pelvic doing? floor and core course it was back in perth eight years ago. uh yeah. was it 2014 or 15 i feel like it was around that time yeah so a long time ago it was a while ago it was good though it was good fun i remember uh, i remember you lifting and um it was awesome it was really good and uh you, i think you was that the yeah, first time you've done heavy dev yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. sure. If, that was the first time, I think, that you did heavy deadlifts, right? Uh, yeah, and you made me do like 60 kilos or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't make I you. I you didn't make you do anything. <laughs> you can't I suggested, make do anything else. I suggested that it was possible, right? It's like, uh, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> I think yeah. I think we're in CrossFit Furnace up north a little bit. But um, yeah. No, so you I challenged my body. <laughs> it was good fun. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I, I taught that course again uh, up in Ballina and I did a one day uh, diastasis done differently as well uh, up there. And that was in around this time last year, 2022. And then October and November, 2022, I started teaching again overseas. So I went to America uh, and taught in Salt Lake City, Atlanta, and um columbus ohio columbus ohio was really nice like it's one of the first inland places that i thought i could really live here like clintonville was really really nice um so yeah Didn't you go to that Canada was nice. that well? well after that i went to new zealand to do the sports camp that i do and then january was dublin cork Glasgow, transited through London to Exeter, came home, San Diego for combined sections meeting uh, where I was presenting with Teresa Wasser and Terry Robertson. Um, and then I came home and then I went to New Zealand about three or four weeks later, I went to New Zealand to teach. That was really fun in Auckland. Came home and then I went to Canada for four weeks. So yeah, that oh, was full on. Really? Yeah, it was full on. So I was in Saskatoon, uh, Saskatoon, Guelph, Cambridge, which are around the Toronto area. Drove to Montreal, taught in Montreal, hung out with Nicola Robertson um, in Sterling and Belleville. And then out of Toronto, to Kelowna, where I presented at the Canadian, uh, the BC Physio um, Association at their conference. I gave a keynote speech there and taught the, the you female athlete ski, there. Though, do you? Pardon? You don't ski. You're in It was also BC, summer. I yeah, you said it was also... No, no, that one was April, April, May. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. I thought you were yeah, there in so January. There. I was like, oh, what a waste, man. What a waste. I I don't ski. I have skied and I reckon I could ski. However, physics dictates that if I touch somebody while tough. skiing, they will, yeah, <laughs> they will get hurt. Um, so I just have to be <laughs> careful if I'm skiing. Uh so yeah, that was mm -hmm. that was Canada. Came home. A couple of weeks later, I was in um but yeah, a few weeks later was uh, Switzerland and Germany, and then came home. Came home, and then that weekend that I came home, I I taught a one day custom course for a Pilates group in on the Gold Coast for their annual continuing ed 
event that they host for their instructors. So that was really cool. And um, yeah, that was a couple of weekends ago. So, so you got your frequent fly points back up again by the sounds of things. Yeah, I made platinum again. It was very frustrating losing it over, over COVID. But um, yeah, it's back. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, in four weeks, I go to the games in America, as well as teaching CrossFit in Florida, games. Jacksonville, the CrossFit Games, yeah, in Madison. And then um, I come home and then I go you over go again. Go and say hi to Anthony. That's it. Come say hi to me at the CrossFit Games. Always happy to help. Um, say hello, catch up, eat, drink, exercise. Uh, and then, yeah, I come back and then I go again to America for Pelvicon in Atlanta. And Can you explain I'm, to me what Pelvicon is? Because I don't, I've never heard of that. Yeah, so a group of physios, Jessica Rial is one of them. Um, it's just a pelvic health conference, like pelvic con. Um, and they got speakers in last year. I wasn't there. And then this year, they've, I think they've got, I think it's bigger. Uh, it sold out last year. It sold out this year. Um, so yeah, go hang out with is a bunch it, of is public it, is health physios. One, or is it? I'm going to say yes. Although I suspect that non-physios will also get stuff out of it. But I suspect, like, I mean, uh, Taryn, Taryn, I think, is speaking at it, for example. Uh, Taryn Hallam. Taryn so, Hallam. yeah. So I suspect it's physio-based. I didn't actually look. <laughs> Just a bunch of friends are going, a bunch of TAs are going. So I'll go hang out with them. And um, it'll be good to catch up. And then I might have a holiday or an event out there like a, a course see whatever happens yeah Is anyone else with anthony's travels i don't know if you want me to visit your neck of the woods organize a course for me i'll come visit <laughs> I, I don't mind i i quite enjoy it but yeah that's what's been going on that and that's what's happening in the future my the youngest is doing his final exams um so Yep, that's cool. And the other two are at uni still. Yeah, wife's just plugging away, going along. Got some, got some projects that I want to finish and some new things that I want to start. So, yeah, we'll see how things go. And we started to um, chat a bit, I guess, earlier in the year about trying to get the podcast up and running again. Because um, every time we did it, We'd always be like, oh, that person is so good. And it was so interesting. And we would, like, I always found it such a good learning opportunity. I, I love being the idiot in the room. And I know you do as well. And just being able to, you know, talk to people who are, you know, really good at stuff and know lots of cool stuff. And um, so we've just been brainstorming a few, few thoughts, a few ideas on people we would like to speak to or topics that we would like to cover. And um, we'd love to hear from other people if there's sort of particular things that they'd be interested in. I've, I know I said to you, Anthony, recently, I've, I've fallen down a bit of a rabbit hole with hypermobility. Um, it's one of those things that, yes, I was, of course, aware of hypermobility and Ellis down loss and these sorts of things, but um, I get a lot of referrals from the pelvic pain clinic where I work. And now that I'm screening a lot more for it, I'm just finding it, the prevalence within that population so high. And I'm doing courses to learn more about how to help support people with um, hypermobility spectrum disorder and EDS. And so I would love to get a couple of experts to come and talk to us about the diagnostic sort of criteria and some of the common difficulties that people struggle with, but also, you know, how can we help these people, you know, because these are things that aren't cured, you know, there are things that, um, you know, there are accommodations that need to be made and, and, but certainly things that we can do as health and fitness professionals to help improve quality of life and resilience and reduce pain and yeah, all that kind of stuff, which I'm super interested in learning more about. So we're going to push for a bit of that. Um, what were your, what were, what are you looking forward to? Look, honestly, I'm happy to hear from lots of different people. Um, the EDS thing, the hypermobility thing is super interesting to me. 
you know, in, in a world where so much of the information is just averaged out for people, you know, my limited experience, just, you know, the people that I see with um, these conditions, they don't track their progress. Like you can't track their progress in the average way. Like it just doesn't look the same. Um, and so, you know, understanding that, um, you know, that that's going to be really cool and and what changes there have been in the research if there's been any I know the classifications changed a few times yeah. um so you know it's always hard to keep up with the names every time somebody comes in and it's like oh okay you, you go I go type up and have a look to see what it's called these days because uh yeah. it, it seems to change a bit so that's going to be cool uh would love to hear you know just different perspectives on all the different pelvic health things, um, you know, things like the, 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 the common ones, pelvic organ prolapse, stress incontinence, urge incontinence, um, you know, pelvic pain, but just different perspectives and different management strategies, um, different experiences and stories too, right? So I, I quite enjoy it when we hear from people who have their story to share. So um, yeah. if any of you know good guests to get on um, yeah. or if you want us to, to ask one of our previous guests to come back for a bit of an update, you know, we were talking about Sally with the endometriosis as one for sure. Um, you know, we definitely want to get back if we can. So all of these things would be awesome. I love learning like you, lifelong learner, happy to just learn from um whoever i'm listening to it's it's going to be fun i miss it i miss it and it's interesting because i think one of the we didn't really talk a lot about overactive bladder uh, i know we talked about bladder pain syndrome um with jilly bond who um for those of you who don't know jilly um or didn't hear that podcast or those two podcasts go back and have a listen because she's just amazing um, so we talked about bladder pain syndrome with her and definitely that sort of biopsychosocial approach to management um, but a lot of what I do these days, so I work as a urogyne um, physio at a public hospital. So I work alongside the, the surgeons, like the doctors in clinic um, one day a week, and then the rest of the time is in outpatient. And it's been um, like a big learning curve for me, um, learning about, you know, the medical and conservative management of um, overactive bladder and just how different people present. And really, I, I find it... Um, it's, it's, it's so interesting because the presentations are so different. So when people say to me, oh, how do you, how do you treat this? It's like, well, <laughs> no two people are the same, right? As with pelvic pain, you know, it's not a recipe. Um, and there's a lot of problem solving, you know, and pelvic floor muscles often have very little to do with urgency. You know, like if anything, they tend to be a bit more upregulated. Um, but they're, you know, doing a shit ton of pelvic floor exercises to prevent the leaking or the urgency um, can often make them worse. So, <laughs> so, so it's like, um, yeah, really putting the detective hat on and figuring out all the different um, uh, factors that can influence that patient presentation, which makes it so interesting, but also that real multidisciplinary approach. So working with the psychologists, the, you know, the urogynecologists, the urologists, the nurses, dietetics, whoever, um, as part of that thing, which I just find super interesting. It's been, yeah, I'm very much on a massive learning curve. I've still got a long way to go, but I am, I'm excited by work. I think it's just, yeah, always learning. I, I that's what I, I love that. I love about it. Absolutely. It sounds exciting, to be honest. Um, and the referral bias, too, you know, like you're probably seeing some of the, the harder ones that aren't doing as well out in the community um, or just the really complex cases. And, you know, that that referral bias, but with your background from sports and musculoskeletal and and being a public health in, uh, physio in the community and then going to such a specialized thing. Like, oh, you're in such a great position. It's it's awesome. I'm so um, I'm so happy for you, and I'm so happy for the, for all the people that that get to interact with you and and benefit from 
everything that you can bring. You've got such a broad uh, base of experience, you know, to bring and and that inquisitive mind, which um, it's it's always fun to watch and to talk with you about such things. <laughs> I think um, I know we've talked about this a lot, but you know that musk experience. I'm so every day grateful for um, having 10 years in Musk. And I'm not saying everyone needs to have 10 years in Musk and a postgraduate Musk degree. I mean, I'm certainly not suggesting that, but like at least a couple of years working with, you know, musculos in a musculoskeletal little clinic is, is so, so helpful. Um, being able to do a decent neuro exam and a, you know, musculoskeletal exam. Uh, being able to treat back pain because you know we know that there's a lot of urgency and back pain that are linked um and if people be being able to sort of treat multiple things at once i think is really important or at least acknowledge the contribution of those different things and how they can interact um but yeah it's i think having that and i know caroline van dyken would totally agree that having that you know uh, pelvic health is just what does she say it's just musculoskeletal in a cave or something yeah something like that something that i as a dude usually don't say because it's just <laughs> it's bad coming from a male so. <laughs> um yeah yeah it's handy it's handy yeah yeah and you know i just i literally not that long ago got off a podcast um as a guest this time and you know principles not protocols so like what we've been talking about having to to investigate and work by the principles and not just okay you have this so we're going to do that but also um you know using those same principles that we use in musculoskeletal orthopedic physio sports physio to helping people with pelvic floor conditions because mm -hmm. there's so much overlap um, and, and one of the points that one of the points that I made on that podcast was, um, you know, the question was, OK, what are some of the indications when you're working with somebody with prolapse or incontinence? What are the, some of the indications that might lead you to ask broader questions um, where red S, you know, relative energy deficiency in sport might be relevant, like asking about their period and, and their energy levels and all the rest of it? And. You know, I was confused at first because I'm like, I don't know, like I don't ever think of, I don't ever think of certain things that come up in an assessment that trigger me to ask these things. It's more the other way around. Why aren't we starting broad? I think that's the default. We start holistic and then we, we get specific with certain areas as the investigation goes along. So, um, you know, just still always working to the the broad to narrow is uh and staying as broad as possible or as long as possible with all the uncertainty it's it's not easy work it's hard work but um but certainly <laughs> worth it um yeah for sure um yeah i think awesome. um i always think about your red slide and and that really simple approach which just makes so much sense and bringing it down to that level of okay clear the red flags <laughs> you know what can they do right now what do they want to be able to do you know that that sort of stuff is is keeping it so so simple but it's so effective it's it's as simple as I can make it and um you know it's I'm trying to get it even simpler but I I, I don't know maybe I'm just too close to it but um, I, I did add a little tagline to it, Marika. Um, it's finding the difference, the different with an S, stroke S, finding the difference that make a difference. That's that's a summary of the slide. Do something <laughs> different. Finding the difference yeah. that make a difference. That's ultimately all we're doing. So the first part is we find out how they do things, what their preferences are. And the second part is we help them explore and discover what the different things that they could do are and we try to find the ones that make a difference in a good way so and i think that's probably you know one of the biggest things i i came away with from your courses was that experiential learning um that that and i, and I, I think that's that 
capacity to be open-minded and to play a bit which um so play explore with movement explore with palpation or cueing or different things so that that person in that moment can have an experience in which maybe they feel stronger or they feel less pain or they feel less heaviness or they leak less or something that is different which is what you're talking about um that can then inspire the next the next stage of the of the rehabilitation process is where I see it and I think I was literally just working with some undergraduates um today doing some tutoring and we were talking about how even within you know within that assessment process like yes we would be looking at you know range of motion for example with someone with back pain or you know how they stand how they move but just that for instance doing that vertical compression what does that mean if you change something you do the same thing does it feel different what does that mean to that person etc cetera, etc cetera. but I think those experiments um those little changes are so valuable because you know we learn through we learn so much through experiencing something and feeling something different rather than being told go and do these exercises go and do these stretches because they'll make you feel better um absolutely and and the funny thing is right is that personal experience is probably the biggest change agent that there is out there like if you experience powerful effects results change no matter what that that's the lowest form of evidence but it's the biggest uh, motivator for change um you know and and it's it's quite funny because we prefer the highest levels of evidence for good reason for good reason because we're so biased there was somebody recently this year on a course um they said to me i i get what you're saying anthony um you know things work just not for the reasons why we think they do i say it a lot on the courses um <laughs> and she goes i get it i really do i understand that but i was one of those people that had like i've tried everything and i saw somebody who was a bit alternative and i started getting better and i know what you're saying that it's not it's probably not for the reasons that they think, but inside, deep inside, it's hard for me to let that reason go because I had such a powerful change. And just reminding people that it's okay to experience the results. In fact, I care more about the end result than I do okay. about the theoretical reasons why it worked, right? Like in the end, we just want people to achieve their goals. Um, yeah the reasons why they're working we we get to debate politely and professionally hopefully <laughs> uh, <laughs> um but yeah you know like i i thought that that was a great illustration of the lowest form of evidence having so much weight against higher forms of evidence um higher levels of evidence and we need to be able to manage both i i think that we should study the highest forms of evidence and utilize the lowest form of evidence to to help people change and uh, oh that feels like it's almost hypocritical it feels almost hypocritical but yeah anyway it's a philosophical it's really interesting, <laughs> it's really interesting though to test your own biases because we have i mean like you know it, within our profession we've moved very much away from epa so electrophysical Electric agents ultrasound yeah etc right stim so i <laughs> yeah so you know a therapeutic ultrasound before i started my recent job i hadn't used in probably 15 plus years maybe i ultrasound on an ankle 10 years ago you know like an acute ankle sprain and i did it because the patient asked me to you know like i'm yep. not big on epa however <laughs> it can work really well in breast conditions like oh yeah for mastitis, mastitis. and 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 laser can work really well for cracked nipples and for um, perineal pain. Um, and from the breast conditions, you see they they ultrasound and they go pump and and the flow increases pretty rapidly. Um, again, why couldn't tell you. I don't even try and lie to my patients and make up stories. Um, but the other one that I've found, which has really challenged my bias, is acupuncture. Mm. So 
for the um, overactive bladder patients and we use, you know, um, uh, sterile needles along the, t the path of the way of the tibial nerve. And I usually do it once a week for four weeks. And we're talking these real sort of stubborn OAB. They've done everything else. Um, sometimes they've even had Botox. They've had, uh, they've been on anticholinergics. They've done tens they've done bladder calming bladder diaries fluid you know they've done it all and then I kind of think well do you want to give it a go <laughs> and they come back and their urgency and their frequency is significantly improved and I yep. just in my head I'm like what the hell I, I still find it hard to understand why and yes there's theories that you know tibial nerve coming up s1 to s3 where the bladder comes in yada 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 like we can hypothesize as to why we can make stories yeah yeah and actually for ptns there's they've done like urodynamic Posterior tibial nerve right really. yeah oh so percutaneous percutaneous so tibial nerve the yeah. in, and then they stim through stim the needles it. yeah 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 um and th they've done urodynamic studies before and after and shown bladder capacity improving, detrusor of activity improving. So not just like a sensory change as in the person feels different or behaves differently, but actually the, the bladder starts behaving differently. So you kind of, I'm still just like, huh. <laughs> My bias well, says, oh, it's a bullshit. And then. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about working on the the thoracic spine and getting gi changes you know that's weird that's still weird to me i i can draw you the lines as to why i think it works um but yeah you know so many contributions and those rib heads sit right next to like there there will be and you know i'm not a big fascia guy uh, but there is a tight connection right there as well as rami communicants between the sympathetic trunk and um and you know the exiting nerve roots there oh wow i've i've seen That's too many nerves, crazy baby. things oh, i know and people have said to me are you a chiro that's very chiro and it's like it's not a profession right it's biology <laughs> it's it's let's be open to what the biology is trying to say we don't have to believe the stories about why, you know, like chiropractors will tell you, okay, traditionally, we thought that the bones were sitting out of place causing this. We know from the research that that's not true. However, we still get these results. So, you know, yeah. there's very scientific evidence-based chiropractors out there doing good things. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's exciting. I think physio is well-placed as a profession to move forward in, in all the different areas that we are interested in, you know, musculoskeletal ortho, sports, pelvic health. Um, you know, we, we, we have a good scientific grounding and we're well positioned to help. And I think we should be supporting each other to, to, uh, to continue to work together and, and really make sure that people have access to the great health benefits that come from seeing uh, you know, physios, health and fitness professionals. I would love to see more, more fitness professional led pelvic floor exercise classes. I don't yeah. think pelvic health physios need to be running them. I think they need to be teaching people how to do the contractions, teach the fitness professionals how to run the classes, but nobody is doing an internal in the middle of a class. So <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And so let's get the fitness professionals out there. It, it, it will be cheaper on average. That will increase the ability for more people to access it. And, uh, you know, the pelvic health physios with their unique skills can see more of the people that need that, um, that assessment. So, yeah, if you're a fitness professional listening. A lot before about accessibility. Pardon? Accessibility, especially in some countries, is is really challenging. And obviously, working with Girls Gone Strong, you know, we would have people in the chat group saying, oh, I'm looking for a public health physio near this town and the nearest one I know of is eight hours away, you know, or yep. something like that. Yep. So, it's terrible. And that, that's just, it's not uncommon. And, and I think things have evolved a lot in the last few years. We've got a lot more people doing 
telehealth, which actually we do a lot of it work. And obviously for things that need an internal examination, we need to be doing things in person. And we certainly don't ever do anything on a camera that is intimate. Um, but <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, you know, of what we do is, is education um, and offering advice based on, you know, subjective, subjective findings and things like that. So there's a lot that, that can be done. Um, but you're talking about the fitness professionals and that's, that's why I do a lot of work with Girls Gone Strong and why you teach a lot with um, fitness in, you know, gyms and in places where it's um, comfortable and, and safe for other people to come in and not feel like, oh, it's just physios and I'm going to be out of place or whatever. But, you know, the, I, I completely... I completely agree. And I think fitness professionals um, are really well placed to run group classes and support mo the vast majority of patients. So people with mild symptomatic prolapse, um, bit of stress incontinence, all those things, you know, the exercise is so valuable. It's so important, mental, physical health, well-being, socialization, all that kind of stuff. I know you and I talk about that for hours but you know I would do anything as a physio to get my to get my clients into spaces where they feel that they can exercise in a in a safe way and we don't have pelvic floor safe exercises and pelvic floor unsafe or prolapse safe and prolapse unsafe that does you know doesn't exist we don't we it, it just doesn't work that way but they're having fitness professionals understand the principles and can and have a really good relationship with the clients and they can help it adjust and adapt and and load like we want them to load we want some adaptation and how fast or slow that is you know that that's variable but we want that moving forward absolutely and you know like you said the fitness professionals see them so much more than than we do and that ability mm -hmm. to to be a part of their lives and hear so much more about not just whatever exercise goal they're they're seeing them for um, is so valuable um, and it's underrated, far too underrated. And um, yeah, anyway, I, I, I just really feel, I really feel, I really feel um, like we should just work more together. It's too, it's too, uh, yeah, people like their kingdoms. Do you know what I mean? People like the kingdoms, people like their silos and um, we, we need to just really get out there and just work together with like-minded people. That's ultimately what it is. And, and I do, I'm a physio. I love physio. I want the best for physio because I'm biased. I'm a physio. Um, and I think the way forward is to lead. I think it's to lead. I think um, it's to empower others, other health and fitness professionals to educate and to really take that leadership forwards not in an arrogant way, but in a way that can demonstrate and people can have an experience of what collaborative learning and, and working with other people feels like, because ultimately that's going to end up with the best result for people. So, yeah, or at least I believe that. Just, it's been interesting for me working with a lot of undergraduates in the last few years um, as, you know, doing the, the tutoring and, I feel like there is still this idea that in physiotherapy uh, in Australia in particular, we have these, because I asked them, oh, do you have any idea what you want to do at the end, end of your final year? And there's still this public, like I'm going to work in a public hospital and do this, or I'm going to go into private practice. So it's this really sort of binary <laughs> thing. And I, I do feel like there is still this idea that you, um, have a pathway and that physio looks a certain way and I hope that people uh, so new physios who are getting out there go and talk to lots of different people you know you and I have done lots of random shit over our careers you know you can see you know you've gone off created your own business traveled the world run workshops you've done that for years as well as your private practice and your sports medicine sort of um, stuff and I've worked in, you know, public and in private and in sports medicine and in mask and ran my own business teaching pre and postnatal exercise classes for like five years, you know, work with girls gone strong and help develop all their program. Like we've just, uh, this is the thing I love about our job is that there is, it's only, you're only really limited by your imagination and your scope of practice, right? Like what you've been trained to do and what you legally can do, but it doesn't have to look 
like I work in a hospital or I work in a, you know, down the road at the local physio clinic. There is so much scope to be doing other stuff you know so I think we can just afford to be a little bit more um yeah a bit more creative in in where we go and, and who we work with and how like you were talking so the reason I was going down this route is just thinking about how, how you were talking about working with you know with fitness professionals working with other professionals having more of a collaborative approach I think it's just the way forward and it could be done a lot better absolutely um lots and lots and lots of topics out there we would love to discuss tell us what you think tell you know marika and i we can chat about anything really um so tell us what you're thinking about and what's really been on your mind leave us a comment below um and let us know if there's any particular topics or guests that you would love to hear from or you would love to hear again and we can always ask them because um there's so many great people out there doing great things. There's so many people doing good work. Would love to um, would love to get lots of different people on there. Lots of different topics as well. Let us know what you want to hear about. And we'll do our best to get them out there for you. And yeah, is there anything else that you wanted to cover today, Marika? Not really. I think we were having a bit of a random chat. I sometimes forget that we're recording and I feel like I'm just talking to you and then I think, oh God, people are going to listen to this now. But that's all right. That's just that's just how we roll. Um, not, no, that sounds great. I, I'd, I'd love to hear what people, uh, people want to hear about and we'll just get some really clever people in and have a good chat. I think that sounds wonderful. And um, so, yes, thank you for listening to us. We uh we look forward to hearing from you we will be back about once a month maybe maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less it really depends on our schedules and what's going on um but yeah it's it's been a fun two years i've missed i've missed i've missed the podcast i've missed interacting with people uh in person so you know we're back again and uh yeah let's Let's keep uh, let's keep this rolling. Please share and let people know that we're back again, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. Bye. Well, that's it for this episode. Be sure to hit like if you enjoyed the episode, and leave any comments or questions below. We'd really like to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified when we release our next episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.